Blog Talk Radio. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this conversation about your Kundalini Awakening experience. Um, Today, I'm honored to be in the Twin Cities, Minnesota, United States, the Twin Cities of St. Paul and Minneapolis. I'm staying at, uh, at, at the, the, my gracious hostess, Rosemary, as all of you may know. And uh, we, are, we have just finished the Health Expo this past Saturday and Sunday. And uh, Rosemary Goliath has graciously allowed me to stay at her place. It is now about 20 degrees below zero, which I actually find quite refreshing. Uh, But there's not a lot of snow here. I'm beginning to think that the snow in Minnesota is somewhat of a myth. But we'll see. We'll see how things progress as I'm here. Um, I would like to welcome... Her Holiness from the Emerald Isle, the Celtic Queen of Questionable Comforts, Amelia Santara. Hello, Amelia. Hello, Chris. Hello, Rosemary. I need a little Uh, applause button here, I think, is what I'm looking for, an applause button, so I'll have to get one added. Okay. Well, next week I'll have some kind of a special effect. I look after it. (laughs) I promise. (laughs) Some some whistles or something. <laughs> anyway, it's good to be here. And um, I'll begin by telling people where they can go if they wish to make a donation to support the work that Quizm does. The place for donations is on the web, and it's at www.ascension-kundalini.blogspot.com. And in the upper right-hand corner is a Donate button. And on pressing that, the instructions are very easy to follow. Um, all donations are gratefully received and are very welcomed. Um, as always, please know there is absolutely no pressure for anybody to donate. Um, it is something that is welcomed because it helps to support the program in a financial way because this is the only way that um, finance is received. So, again, if you're in a position to donate, if you wish to donate, just go to that website, press the donate button, and um, that would be wonderful. So, the address is www.ascension kundalini.blogspot.com and if that doesn't suit you and you still would like to donate you can get in contact with me and I can give you details of how to do that through a bank and my address is my email address is kundalini matters at gmail.com so that's it Chris I'm looking forward to the show um, oh, thank, you. thank you my dear okay. go ahead and and and, and I, I suppose I would love to hear a little bit about the um, expo that you were at, if you would okay, like to yes, share we, something we of were, that we during the, the show. We were at the Healthy Life Expo, and uh, Rosemary had made arrangements to make that occur, and so I was fortunately able to, because we flew with Southwest, we were able to change the flight for a week earlier, so that was... Uh, uh, happily able to come out here for three weeks rather than two, and I feel like I have come into my my little winter wonderland here. If I could show you pictures, I'm I'm looking off to about my my ten o'clock and looking through these gorgeous, beautiful, clear windows that Rosemary has at her house, and I'm looking at uh, snowy and and long pine trees uh, going off into the distance. Very, very nice. And as I mentioned earlier, it's about 20 degrees below zero, which what I think uh, equate to something really cold in Ireland. But it's nice. Yes, it's it nice does. To just, it does, actually. I can't imagine it being that cold, though, Chris, and without snow. That's strange. Yes, 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 exactly. <laughs> I, I saw a lovely, um, oh, wait a I minute. don't know who posted Rose, it, Rose, but it says... Me. 
She says it's 20 degrees above zero. My bad. Still cold. <laughs> ah, that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> That's totally different. You just the little, well, jumped 40 <laughs> degrees. Do you realize there's a difference of 40 degrees? <laughs> the little said. thermometer has a 20 on it, and the big hand was on the 20. Doesn't that make it 20 below? No. <laughs> anyway. Okay, well, that explains the lack of snow. I was going to say, um, you know, paradise doesn't have to be tropical. It can be just as beautiful as snow. But, um, oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's, a, it's a very silent beauty. Very, very nice. Uh, today... Everyone, today we're going to talk about attachments, attachments to having expectations of of anything within the Kundalini context. Most most of the time, we have attachments towards power. The ego greatly wants to aggrandize itself, and we we have an attachment towards being recognized by our fellow person for having such great and monumental power. And as those attachments uh, encounter the kundalini, the kundalini quite often will bring up levels of truth that will counteract uh, many of the hopes and the desires and the dreams and the expectations that the, uh, that the, the ego would have about attachments. And this can be an exceptionally painful process. Uh, I mean, imagine having your... You know, if you have a dream of being a certain type of uh, profession, uh, uh, a dentist or a, or a movie star or, a, you know, a, a, a captain on a fishing boat, you know, whatever your desire is, whatever your dream is, and the Kundalini comes up and it, it doesn't necessarily go along with, with what your ego had planned for your life. And it, and it begins to really... Uh, in, in many ways, destroy that inner understanding, that inner wish, that inner hope, that inner desire of becoming that movie star, that great singer, or that wealthy billionaire, or whatever it might be. Typically, it's it's something quite outlandish for, for some folks, not for everybody. But uh, the Kundalini comes along and says, oh, no, 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 my child, this this is not for you at this time. And gently but irrevocably crushes that desire in the person. This and, and if this comes in a in a in a in a surprise way or a quick way, it can be devastating to the personality. And so, you know, this this ties right in with with having levels of surrender that allow you to surpass the attachments and the expectations of the ego, even if we don't know that we have them, even if we, we deny them to other people, you know, that we have any attachment, you know, say we're fairly, uh, you know, gifted along the spiritual path and we're having, you know, we have the kundalini, we're having phenomena, we're having all the different things and many of the of the gifts are already present. Those attachments can still be there. Those attachments can really be there, and they can thwart. They can thwart. They can. They can block uh, the level of development that the person is is striving towards within the kundalini, or at least the the level of development that the kundalini within the person is striving for. This can be extremely devastating. You know, just a second here. Thank you. This can be extremely devastating towards a person who may be very, very, very goal interest, you know, uh, goal oriented. It can be extremely devastating when when a person has made certain plans along a certain plane of education, of occupation, of of uh, of uh, you know, of interest, uh, uh, romantic interest, or or any kind of a of a, of a level of attachment that occurs for the person that they're hanging on to. You know, you might be in the middle of a difficult situation and you're hanging on to that other attachment to get you through it. And the Kundalini may just come right along through, through circumstances or through, through, through more, more, more than likely arranged circumstances 
uh, through a teacher, through a friend, through a, a, a you know a family member, through an employer or, or, or fellow employee, that that attachment can be dashed to pieces. And then what do you do? Where, what you know? How are you picking up those pieces? And the best way to pick up those pieces is to not have those attachments in the first place. Do your very best to surrender to the Kundalini. Now, I'm going to do a little bit of a sound check here with Santara, if you wouldn't mind coming back online. Um, Unable to have the chat group, even though I have my little computer here, it's just not giving me a chat group. How is the sound coming through? The sound is fine, Chrism. I just did a check, and and it's, it's fine. They're reporting it's okay. It's good. And who do we have in our chat room today? Hello, everyone. We have Elizabeth. We have Sashji. We have MJ. We have Back Backstech, and we have a number of guests with, with you know numbers after them. Well, thank you for joining us, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us, and I'll dive right back into this. Thank you, Santara, for the sound check. So as we have these attachments and we come into the kundalini, certain areas of those expectations are going to be amplified. They may be amplified far beyond what what an unawakened person might might be able to generate. And with that amplification become, you know, there comes an amplification of loss when the kundalini comes along and says, hey, this attachment, you know, This attachment isn't really the way you might have been seeing it, my child. This is not how you may have wanted it to turn out. This this is not in line with, the reality is not in line with your expectation. And that great level of sadness, that great level of grief, that great level of realization that, oh my God, you mean I, I can't be a Hollywood star? You know this this doesn't this this can come down pretty hard on a kundalini person. And I know this goes against the whole ideology of how it was like you can be anything you want to be. You just got to put your mind to it, put your thoughts to it, put your heart into it, put your emotions into it and you can just go and do whatever you want. Well, it's just not true within a kundalini context. Kundalini is far more about a lack of attachment than it is about a giving or a signing of attachment. It's not so much about, you know, rewarding the attachments of the ego than a person might think. I hope you're following me with this because this is a big deal. This, this, this is a, a level of heartache. This is a level of, of, of hurt that is inside. This is something that, you know, it's, it's almost similar to a broken heart. It really, really can engender a lot of pain. And, you know, it's all because, you know, we buy in to our ego's control over our life. We buy in to having it, you know, having life the way we want it. Uh, when we want it, and and you know, in precisely the the exact format of what our fantasy has promoted, we support our attachments through our love. We support our attachments through our expectation. We support our attachments through our our work and our sacrifice to make those attachments come into life for us. And if the kundalini comes up and says, no, 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 not this attachment, not that attachment, well, it can really, 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 really hurt. And I want to, you know, I want to, to give all of you a level of, of education about these attachments and, and, and what they can lead a person into. Let's talk about uh, having an attachment of wanting to be a super psychic. Let's talk about the attachment of of wanting to be a great uh, psychic reader or a great medium or a great channeler. Let's talk about 
thwarting the kundalini and saying, forget you, kundalini. I'm just going to go in and I'm going to channel all the people I can channel. I'm going to become this great channeler. And in some cases, when you when you go against uh, the divine force within you, it can have devastating results. There are people up here in the Twin Cities that I've already communicated with that have been that have worked along that line. They've worked along that line with with a level of of innocent ignorance that has caused them to be consumed by a fire that is partially of the kundalini but it's it's supported by entities entities whose sole program is to corrupt and destroy the human spirit the human body the human potential and these people have reached in to the lower astral with their you know their hearts open wide their their minds open for domination and these people have been indeed dominated. One of them I was talking to has been dominated so completely that that person is being burned from the inside out. The entities are, are you know, latching onto her kundalini, and, and because she gave such permission to have that occur, that kundalini is being stimulated more and more and more. It will allow it. It will allow it because of the person's level of commitment to their attachments, their ego attachments. And so this poor person is being, you know, almost confined to a wheelchair, you know, is in constant pain and is constantly searching for different ways to alleviate that pain without even being able to recognize the attachment to being a great and majestic healer. I come into the Twin Cities here just just last uh, Thursday, and, you know, this place is burgeoning with channelers. I'll be going somewhere tomorrow to, you know, listen to somebody channel Jesus, <laughs> for crying out loud. <laughs> um, and I'm going to go there on purpose. I'm going to go there to to look at what these entities are doing and how many actually are being channeled if one if a, the person says oh i'm channeling jesus and jesus and and or maybe all 12 of the apostles will be coming through me at the same time you know i'm going to look to see and 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 observe how this is being done and and what quality of entity is is actually infesting the person and what quality of entity is actually infesting the audience as well and how the uh, the energies, the life force energies from the audience members are also being uh, partaken of and how certain levels of control are being initiated upon the willing participants, participants of these channeled sessions. Uh, this has everything to do about attachment. The attachment of being a great and powerful leader among humanity, uh, the attachment of great and powerful levels of ego aggrandizement, even though, you know, they're, they're following what, a, what you know, a, a somewhat of a Christian approach, you know, not that, you know, not all approaches within the Christian kingdom are, are quality approaches, you know, some are, but many aren't. And, and I, you know, when we allow ourselves to become infested with such levels of, of arrogance and and control and hurt and things of that nature, you know, we can really begin to be led astray. You know, if we just would follow the safeties, just follow the safety protocols you can find on Kundalini Awakening Systems, the number one dot com. You know, you follow that approach and you really, really save yourself a lot of heartache, a lot of pain, a lot of of uh, health issues, a lot of mental and psychological and emotional issues. But people don't know about that as much as I would like them to know about that. I'm trying to change that, but it's it's not the uh, it's not the self-aggrandizement route. It's not the route that we can take and go, oh, my gosh, Rosemary, 
Rosemary, you're, you know, the, I, you know, Rosemary's channeling all of the Kundalini awakened nuns from the past. Saint Teresa of Avila, uh, uh, Saint Hildegard of Bingham. Oh my gosh, Rosemary. Oh, let us all pro and pray and throw money at Rosemary. And I'm just using using you as an example, Rosemary. <laughs> This has everything to do about self-aggrandizement. This has everything to do about getting money. You know, I come around the Twin Cities here, and it's so amazingly concentrated with channelers. It's as if channeling is the latest deal here. I mean, I, maybe it is elsewhere, too. I just noticed a more uh, condensed uh, level of, of infatuation with that form uh, here in the Twin Cities. Here to do this because I don't, I don't suggest people do channeling in any way, shape, or form. There is only one energy that and consciousness that I'll suggest anybody begin a good conversation with, and that's your Kundalini, and that's the Kundalini that's dormant and the last three vertebra of the base of your spine. Now, if you have any questions about this, if you are a, a a Minnesota resident and you're part of this whole channeling thing, you know, feel free. Come on over. Call in 347-934-0026. And, uh, you know, tell us why you're doing it. And I know, I know that you'll be compelled to say, oh, Master Christian, you have this all wrong. I just here, I'm here to heal. I'm here to give of myself that and and by giving of myself that means I I don't mind sharing my body with a thousand or ten thousand entities that are coming through me to promote the welfare of humanity. It's just not happening that way here. You know, we've got people that are channeling the UFOs, we got people that are channeling uh, biblical figures. We got people that are channeling Jesus and the twelve apostles, and you know some Greek, ancient Greek goddess, some ancient Roman goddess, some ancient Chaldean god. I mean, you name it, uh, Egyptian gods. You know, galore. You know, you don't see anybody going. Yes, I channeled Guido the ditch digger. Yeah, hello. I channeled Guido the Ditch Digger. Oh, my. A great wall of silence. Uh, you know, because Guido is not uh, Cleopatra. Guido is not Jesus. Guido is not Guatama. Guido is not Zoroastri. You know, Guido is a ditch digger. Just a simple man. Why can't he have such great levels of wisdom? Digging a ditch is no easy thing. It takes a lot of discipline, takes a lot of work, takes a lot of stamina, takes a lot of uh, uh, takes a lot of 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 strength to do this type of a thing. It is not easy. I think Guido would have something really, really positive to say for humanity. But you know what? Guido doesn't feed the ego. You know, channeling Guido the ditch digger is not going to make you a million dollars. You see? And so we really see. We really see when we look at the, the plethora of channelers around here. You know, you know, Jesus, Cleopatra, the Pleiadians. I mean, you name it. They're channeling it, except for the ordinary person. Guido the ditch digger. I mean, there were many, many ditch diggers throughout history. You think they might have something positive to contribute, but no. Now, of course, you know, someone's going to go out there and they'll go, yes, well, I can, I, I'm a channeler. I can, I can channel Guido the ditch digger. Here, let me just tune in. And, you know, you watch their body go through all these jerks and shakes. And then it's like, hello. I'm Guido the Ditch Digger. How are you? You know, <laughs> this is something that that we really need to look at as far as an attachment towards self-aggrandizement, an attachment to be known as that great 
spiritual leader. And yet it's an attachment that can do such amazing levels of damage to the person. Uh, everybody seems to want to be a medium. Everybody wants to be John of God. Everybody wants to be, uh, you know, somebody who can handle great levels of spiritual wisdom. And you know what? I don't think that's a bad deal. You know, spiritual wisdom is always something that people can use. Why not just give it away? <laughs> Sorry, I'm being pinged here. Uh, let's see how this works. Ping, ping, ping. Ping. Ah, uh, there's the ping. Yes. Uh, just a moment. There we are. And I suppose I'll get, I, I'm going to get one more ping just to let you know. My apologies for that. Um, I, I'm not quite sure how to turn the pings off. Uh, I, I would like to publicly thank Josephine Smith for, for uh, gifting me a, a smartphone that seems to be much smarter than I am. And uh, so it, it, uh, it's probably going to ping me again. And so thank you. <laughs> thank you, Josephine. Um, th and thank you, Ed. And thank you, Rosemary. Thank you, Amelia. Thank you, Magdalene. Thank you, everybody who's providing this, these services and these types of gifts to me so that I may reach out into the populations as I'm doing now. Uh, look at your level of attachment. Look at your level of wanting to be recognized. Look at your level of wanting to be famous. Look at your level of, of, of taking money from people uh, and, and, and actually infecting them instead of helping them, infecting them with entities. This is much like Reiki people reaching their hands into the cosmos and saying, spiritual masters, plug into my hand and give this person a healing. Yeah. How many entities do you think are just waiting for that permission? Not only for the for the for the, the 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 Reiki practitioner, but for the victim lying on that massage table or sitting in that chair, do you know wherever they are opening themselves to this type of assistance. Be very cogent of your attachments. Be very cogent of how you wish to promote yourself in this world and why you're promoting yourself. I would suggest that you, the best thing that you could do is start a conscious conversation with your kundalini. Let it help you express yourself. Let it help you direct yourself. Let it help you within the safeties and, or within any other system that the kundalini directs you towards. The kundalini, not some entity posing as the kundalini. Let it help you find the focus for how it wants you to express itself in your life. And it doesn't necessarily mean you have to quit your job or divorce your, how, your, you know, your spouse. It doesn't mean these things. You can just start doing other things in addition to the current life you're already living. You can be that music producer. You can be that tour guide. You can be that movie star. You can be that president of a company. You can be that ditch digger. You can be the dentist, the doctor, the bus driver, the policeman, the, the fire woman. You can be all of these things in addition to having the kundalini and listening to the kundalini. You don't need to channel XYZ. You don't need to channel Cleopatra. You don't need to channel, you know, Ra, the sun god. You don't need to channel anybody. One of the, you know, one of the famous channelers was uh, was Edgar Casey, and uh, his, you know, there was never any kind of self-aggrandizement coming from that source. No one ever got a name. No one ever got a. A charge. Matter of fact, it was all about service. It was all about helping. You don't see so much of that here in the Twin Cities. Now, we have so many beautiful people here, though. So many amazing people in the Twin Cities. Uh, but a lot of them are getting kind of just hooked in 
to this channeling thing. And and I want to provide another outlet for that. The Kundalini in me has brought me here three times now. This is the four times. This is the fourth time I've been here in this beautiful, wonderful city, this beautiful, wonderful state. And it's time, I think, that the kundalini within me wants to express itself and, and to give people the option of, of accepting the, the divine force at the base of their spine as a controlling aspect of their spiritual uh, voyage, their spiritual journey, their spiritual level of awareness within them. Open to the divine within yourself, people of the Twin Cities, Minnesota. Open to the divine at the base of your spine and let that flourish. Forget about these attachments of self-aggrandizement. Forget about these attachments of power and position. Open yourself to, to that which is far beyond human measured success of power or position. Open yourself to the, to the exceptionally exalted and majestic quality of divine grace that is already in you. Already waiting for you to recognize it, that it may recognize you. Now, if you have any questions about this or any other subject, I would like you to call in at 347-934-0026. And I'm being joined by Rosemary. And Rosemary, what are your feelings about the, 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 the levels of attachment and the levels of, uh, of channeling that we might be experiencing here in the Twin Cities? And 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 it's interesting that you set us up to go out and listen to Jesus speak. Tell us about that a little bit. Well, that was a recommendation from one of our students in our last seminar when I had asked people to direct me. So that's how that happened, not knowing. And it's a um, metaphysical group that's been around together for some time. So we're just going to their monthly meeting, well, showing the film, and that will be helpful. Um, I do have a really great gift of um, from my kundalini, and I may have shared this before, but it was last July when I was up in far, heading to, into Fargo to take the film, to show the film. And my friend and I were waiting in the library until we could get into the church and set it up. And I observed her. She was on her laptop, and I was on mine. And I looked, and she was so engrossed with who she was listening to and I could started to listen and it was this woman saying all she had learned from Michael and I, I knew that it was channeling and I was thinking from my background Michael the Archangel and I was squirming on my chair and I got her attention and these words came out of my mouth and I am eternally grateful I said, my goodness, I said, we have the eternal creator of Michael in ourselves waiting to be activated and to guide us and direct us and do even greater things than that. And then that was the first level. And then later, months later, I was at a, a meeting and I I was a little bit late, so I missed the introduction. And it took me a bit to realize it was something was different for me, and I didn't know what it was. This woman was channeling. I was right in the presence of it happening, and I didn't know who it was, but somebody stood up at the question and answer and said just to the woman, thank you, Michael. And then I learned that and found out after that my friend wasn't listening to the benefits quote of Michael the Archangel. It's a group of spiritual beings who call themselves Michael, like over 500 of them. And uh, that was quite an alarming thing, but it was great to see it come together and see myself in the midst of it. And oh my goodness. Well, yeah, yeah. And so, it, you know, there's a, there was an old book out there, uh, you know, messages from Michael and, you know, 
the one of one of the greatest levels of of uh, of coercion is to base certain levels of coercion in truth, and the rest of it you can fill in with that which isn't so true. And you know, in this in this context, you know, you know, like Ramtha, you know, Ramtha got busted. I don't know if you know who Ramtha is. Ramtha is this supposed thirty five thousand year old entity that doesn't need to take a body anymore, but but he does have a need, you know, that has this real great love for horses. You know, and so, and I'm not going to mention her name. You know, and so a great many people are talking about, uh, you know, are listening to this Ramtha person and saying, oh, I'm so Ramtha that, you know, and they, they quit their jobs, they move to places where Ramtha said this or that, they they do all of these things and they you know you know you know they're being warned. I listen to these tapes, so I know I know what I'm talking about. I listen to these tapes, you know. They call them intensives, like the uh, uh, you know the Hawaiian intensive or the you know they named it after big cities. Anyway. And so great geological upheavals were going to happen in the latter part of the of the 1990s and the 1980s. And oh my gosh, we better get moving. We've got to save our children. We've got to put together a new community. We have to do everything because Rumpha said it's true. Well, guess what, folks? It wasn't true. And a lot of people changed their lives and lost their relationships and lost their employment and, and you know, began a very serious downward spiral into depression and, and decay and, and lack of trust in their own inner resources, all because some 35,000-year-old entity decided he, he wanted to take over the body of a blonde. Not that blondes are prone to that or anything like that. I'm not I'm certainly not saying that. I'm just saying that because that's you know that's what she is. So I you know I, I found it I find it very 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 challenging uh, in this environment here as far as entities are concerned. Uh, uh, one of one of one of the uh, one of the members you know has just developed a a wide open third eye ability to view entities to see that which is infiltrating the bodies of so many, and certainly the bodies of those who want to be the great channeler, the next great conversations with God type person, right? The next great money machine. All you got to do is let your body squirm a little bit, jerk a little bit left, jerk a little bit right, jerk a little bit forward, jerk a little bit backward, Contort your facial expression and say, "Hello, my name's Guido, the ditch digger, and I have some very good advice for you about digging a ditch." And people will throw money at your feet and say, "Oh my gosh, I've been blessed by Guido, the ditch digger." You know who has no ego because he's a ditch digger. You know, and you know what you. <laughs> This is all about attachment. This is all about attachment to being great, to being wealthy, to being rich, to 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 being seen as some great spiritual god or goddess. And you know, yet all of us are great spiritual gods and goddesses. Nobody is better than anybody else. Kresham the Kundalini is equal to Guido the Ditch Digger. Is equal to uh, you know, Dolores the donut maker, or Peter the 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 the, the, the pickle maker, or 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 you know, Tommy the, the the cabinet maker. I mean, you know, it's all we are all equal in the body. Nobody is better. Nobody is more important than anybody else. You see, that's the problem. It's the ego that is is condensing attachments into opportunities for corruption. And these entities are just waiting out there 
waiting around you, waiting as as Julia said last week, and waiting in the malls or or waiting near the motels or waiting in restaurants or waiting in in uh, supermarkets, waiting everywhere for an opportunity to corrupt a, a a human being, to take them off of a of a path of love and and helpfulness and kindness and consideration and truth and honesty and diligence and tolerance and forgiveness to take them off of that path and they're all over the place you, we're not going you know there is no holy ground that they're not there uh Santara and I we we even went to Shot which to American people looks like charters in France this great, great, beautiful cathedral of Schott. And in that, in that beautiful artwork and that, that wonderful labyrinth that has been copied and, 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 and spread all over the world, there were entities all over the place there. And we even photographed some. They come across as orbs with faces in them. Most of the orb uh, phenomena are entities, are spiritual consciousness. Okay, so now if you have any questions or comments about this or any other subject related to your kundalini, I'd like you to to give a call at 347-934-0026. And I'm going to hand the microphone over to our beautiful, wonderful, angelic hostess, uh, not even channeling Cleopatra. She is just channeling the beautiful, wonderful person that she is that she is, Rosemary, for some announcements of some of our happenings that are happening here in the Twin Cities area this week and next week. Thank you. We've talked often about the seminar coming. That's February 21st and 22nd here in the Twin Cities. And we have still have room for people my information is 651-452-3161, rosemarygg at usinternet.com. The uh, location of the seminar is in Egan. It's across the river here from the airport, 10 minutes, 15, and uh, likewise in, in real close distance in to both cities. Welcome. We welcome everyone to come. Also this week, the week before a seminar, Kristen comes and he came a week early to do the expo, and I'm just eternally grateful. It was a great contribution to our work. And um, we also had some of our students there, so we had the, the Kundalini community, the students from the other seminar. It was just a wonderful experience uh, to be together and to do that. We have a couple talks that Kristen will be doing this week. First of all, I want to say Saturday. We we set Saturday aside for the afternoon for our Kundalini community, um, mainly the members of the last seminar, and they are we're gathering together at one of uh, one of their homes and spending a couple hours with Kristen on uh, the on Valentine's Day. It leaves uh, the rest of the day for people with family. But we're looking forward to that. And then on um, Monday evening, there is a, a woman who does regularly, once a month, peace and tranquility medica- meditations. That are a number of group, a number of people come to that. Uh, she's she's just very gifted and has that kundalini in an informal way. If that that ever applies to to what I'm saying. But she has agreed to host Chrisim. So I haven't talked with her. I don't know how many uh, guests she's expecting. Uh, Tuesday, we will be at uh, one of the the local co-ops that has uh, meeting rooms, as maybe in your town they do. This is for people listening from the cities. It is the uh, Mississippi Market, uh, 6 to 8 p.m., this, the West 7th store, Tuesday, February 17th. And uh, we're looking for, I'm looking forward to seeing 
uh, the, the group that we have. And what I love is the one whole side wall is glasses, glass wall, glass windows, where everybody coming into the store will get a glimpse of what's going on in there. On Thursday, uh, Kristen will be speaking in Burnsville, which is a little further south than Egan, but, but the neighbor neighboring um, town to Egan. And um, we've been there a couple times and always uh, good interaction. And I, I know that will be the same this Thursday. That is 7 to 9 at Metamorphosis, and that's on Cliff Road there in Burnsville. And again, I have more details if you'd like them. Rosemary at 651-452-3161 or rosemaryg at usinternet.com. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rosemary. And and once again, you know, Chrisom is not the end-all, be-all. Chrisom is just another person like you, consciousness clothed in flesh. There is no big deal about Chrisom. He, you know, he puts his pants on one leg at a time, except when he's already got them down by his ankles. Pulls them right on. <laughs> so, so I, you know, we are as we are. We are gifted with Kundalini. Uh, when we reach uh, a level of understanding where that gift can come forward, and that gift has come and come forward, and in people like Rosemary Goliath and and Amelia Santara and 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 Fasci and many of the other people, uh, Elizabeth Dalton Gonzalez and and uh, Magdalene De Deus and many of the other people that you've heard on this program before. This this is all about the Kundalini. This is not about uh, uh, channeling some great historical figure. This is not channeling some ET from the Pleiades or some ET from Orion or some other star system. This is not about the Brotherhood of the Great Galactic Federation or any of those other uh, very interesting, uh, shall we say, species of intelligence that people like to to channel through their corporeal bodies, through their through their five body system. This is about what you've already got. This is about you. This is about the divine within you. This is about awakening that divine within you so that you can walk through this world as a grace upon this world, affecting other people's grace and helping them respond to their own grace at the base of their spine and so on and so forth. This is why we are here. This is why I'm traveling all over this place, doing it, trying to get people to, to understand at least what their potentials are, regardless of whether they want to awaken that potential. That's fine. That's their choice. But you need to know, you need to know the amazing levels of grace that are within you waiting for your interest, waiting for your trust, waiting for your ability to surrender into it rather than surrendering into an ego-based attachment. And it's all about the ego here, folks. It's all about the ego. It's all about attaching wants and desires and expectations to the ego, to that little kid behind your eyes and behind your heart, the one that fears, the one that has fear of loss and desire for gain. The one that wants to win the game. Be first. Have the most money. Have the most power. Have the nicest clothes, the nicest car. You know, have everybody bowing and scraping at their feet and going, oh my gosh, maybe I too can be like you and have all that money and and blah, blah, blah. That's what it's about. We're talking commercial spiritualism. We're talking commercially corrupt spiritualism. When we're talking people going into their attachments and making them come true at any cost, we're talking about a corrupt form of spiritualism. When we talk about kundalini and going within, when we talk about using free information, to go within and activate that grace at the base of your spine, the kundalini, 
at the base of his mind and surrendering to that force. Not a prison. And that is your teacher. Then, of course, yes. Surrender to your outside teacher and your inside teacher that your inside teacher has led you to. That is absolutely. As within, so without. As below, so above. That's part of an equation. But you only do it at the behest of the kundalini within you. The kundalini, folks. The divine source of the force within you. Now, if you have any questions about this, call 347-934-0026. And I'm going to ask Her Holiness Santara to come on board here. She, oh, and I'd like to extend congratulations to Amelia Santara and the whole O'Connor clan were their newest addition, and his name is what, Santara? <laughs> his name is Alex. Alex Daniel, and it's not my addition, it's in the sense that it's a grandson, it's our latest grandson, so we're all very happy, <laughs> all went kind, well, thank you. Kind of your addition, don't you think? <laughs> well, yes, but people might think it was a new addition of mine, a baby of mine, it's not. <laughs> people don't know how old I am by my voice, you know. <laughs> the baby of the baby. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So thank you. Yes, we're filled with gratitude, and it's a great joy to have him with us. Uh, Santara, have you been yes? able to to collect any questions from from any yes, of the Yes, I have some. Uh, well, I have some questions, Susan. Um, let me see. I have them here. Um, Okay, there's a few. One of them is, do children who have kundalini or who are going to come into the kundalini, kundalini later in life behave differently or develop differently to other children? Well, a lot of these uh, these uh, HDHD or a, what is that, HD, whatever it is. I don't know. ADD. Yeah, HDD, <laughs> ADD, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the uh, multiple acronym uh uh, uh, a name for some of these conditions of hyperactivity or lack of attention on the really boring class that they're being forced to sit into after being fed high fructose corn syrups and other really, really powerful stimulants and being forced to try to sit still and learn from somebody moving their mouth at the head of the class that's not really interested in the class that they're teaching. Yeah, yeah, they like to... Uh, to to prescribe drugs for these kids because they will uh, find uh, you know scholastic levels of attention somewhat uninteresting. I was one of those kids. They wanted to give me Ritalin, but my mother forbade it. You know, and and uh, you know, I I I was able to go to high school, college, the whole bit. You know, and and it, it's it's just it's pathetic. But people that, the, the kids that have kundalini symptoms early on will definitely be different. And if they're allowed to just flourish along the lines of them, they can become great, amazing people. You know, Newton had kundalini. Famous scientists had kundalini. They had all the symptoms, talking to animals, having animals land on them, um, seeing great spiritual uh, uh uh, information just coming into them out of the divine oneness. They had all these experiences. And so the the kids that are allowed to have the kundalini, not necessarily be, you know, led into channeling or anything like that, but allowed to have the experiences that the kundalini wants them to have and, and, and have an understanding of the force within them. They They will act differently. They will act you know, in, in ways that are far beyond uh, in, in intellect, in maturity, uh, to those children around them. Yes. Mm. Over. Okay. For now. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Now, are all entities equal in how we ignore them? Because recently on the group there was a discussion about entities attaching, you know, who are particularly focused on, say, the sexual energies, and they latch well, the, on. Yeah, 
the, the incubi and the succubi, are they all yes. e- they're all equal to be ignored for sure. You know, the incubi and the succubi, those are just sexual feeders. That's all that is. And the best way to get rid of them is to, is to first of all, don't let them attach to you. You can do that by waving your arms through them and telling them to stay away. You know, the problem with, with, with that is that the, certainly um, the entity will kind of creep up to a person when they're sleeping and begin to stimulate the sexual organs. And the person, you know, will just think that they're having this great, you know, sexual dream or whatever. And, you know, they'll allow the attachment to occur. But once they start seeing, once you start seeing what is actually attaching to you, well, let me tell you, your sexual interests will go right out the window. They are not the prettiest of creatures. They are not there with the kindest intent. In many ways, they are there to drain the life force from the individual. And so, of course, once you recognize what's happening there, you, you, you command them away, you lead them away, you refuse to allow them any contact to the point of putting your hands over your genitals. To the point of not having sex and not allowing that. And you, you, you make mistakes. You know, when this first happened to me, I was like, well, jeez Louise, look at that greasy thing that's attaching itself to me. Oh, my God. I got to get rid of this. How do I get rid of this? You know, and, uh, you know, I've meditated on it for a while. And it's just like going, okay, I'm just going to be very, very diligent and discerning about when this comes. I know that when it starts to try to stimulate that area of the body, then I'm going to uh, I'm going to start waving my hands through the air right around it and say, "Get out, get away! You've got no right. I do not give you permission." And as you do that, they they can't really attach to you, but they're patient. They'll wait till you stop waving your hands around, and they'll try again, and they'll try again, and they'll try again, and, and you just got to stop them at every turn. Basically, slap them. Now I told them. After the fourth or fifth try, I told them, I said, this, this is not going to continue. You need to stop. Now, this is, this is how Chrisom responded at the time. This is not how everybody can respond. But because, because I am who I am and, 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 and I do have certain skill sets that I could use, uh, as soon as they did it again, I got real pissy, angry. And I slammed my head back onto the pillow, and I astral projected right to where they were. And we had, shall we say, a, a, a discussion, a very pointed <laughs> discussion, a very pointed with a stick discussion about whether or not they were going to come feeding on my flesh anymore. Okay. Now, I know not everybody can do that, but I'll tell you what. If you can, don't hesitate. They have no right to feed on you. There is no karmic bond that says, oh, thou shalt have to be fed upon by a succubus or an incubi. There is nothing out there that says that. They are not more powerful than you. They are, in actuality, they are mere parasites. As all entities are mere parasites, especially especially those who try to, to latch on to the individual and to, to take energy from them or take uh, validation or to try to give direction to. These are just entities that are afraid to get the body themselves. Or they built up so much karma that they're here in the lower astral and they're not allowed to have a body until they're willing to to face some of the negative aspects of the karma that they have created. And most of them just aren't going to do that because they're just cowards. Out and out cowards. I can't put it any cleaner. Okay? These are demons of a lower dimension trying to influence the five sense blind human. And the Kundalini will allow that. And you might ask me, well, Rosemary, you might ask me, why would the Kundalini allow that? Why would the Kundalini allow that? Well, I'll tell you why the Kundalini would allow that. <laughs> Thank you, Rosemary. The Kundalini would allow that because there are certain levels of testing that need to occur. Levels of forgiveness. Levels of tolerance. Levels of love. Levels of honesty. Levels of truth. Levels of, 
of discipline, levels of practice, levels of helpfulness to other people, levels of spiritual evolution. In what greater way than to use negative entities stuck in their negativity than to help a person excel by doing the opposite that, a, that an entity would have you do? If it tells you to 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 have a grudge, then forgive. You know, and just follow that format. Improve yourself every step of the way, no matter what the entities may try to tell you to do. And not everybody's going to be able to discern these entities. They're not so powerful that they come to everybody and they cut into everybody's consciousness. But when the Kundalini comes up, well, then, when the Kundalini comes up, because Kundalini gives you skill sets that are telepathic, gives you skill sets that are empathetic, gives you skill sets that are psychic viewing, psychic hearing, well, then, so, yeah, then they can begin to participate with you in these ways, and the Kundalini will often allow it. Not always. Not always. Rosemary has a string of, uh, of, of really positive angels around her. They won't allow that with Rosemary. Kundalini allowed it with me, though. I was seeing entities most of my life. Still can, if I want to. And other students who've been traveling with me lately, they're seeing them by the thousands. But they're also being given the ability to turn that off. When you when you when you awaken the kundalini by virtue of uh, magic mushrooms or drugs, you know any of the uh, the you know psilocybin or or anything except perhaps the ayahuasca, uh, you don't get the opportunity always to turn it off, and that's what can drive a person right into the psych ward. Right into the psych ward, don't pass. Go. I think that's a monopoly term. Excuse me if I used it wrong. Mm-hmm. <laughs> ah, and so yeah, yeah. Uh, kundalini children, kundalini children. If <laughs> getting getting back to the question, kundalini children can, or, or I'm sorry, uh, <laughs> the, the entities. <laughs> The entities, you know, there are different kinds of entities. You know, some entities are, are more towards corruption within, say, stealing. Some entities are more in the corruption of of, of uh, emotional corruption, like purposefully uh, breaking a person's heart just for the fun of seeing that person go through those paroxysms of pain. Some entities are are just there to one one uh, individual was telling me uh he says yeah you know you know i i, I know i I'm, I'm kundalini awake i got that i know that i get it i understand but before i knew before i understood i would stand over my newborn child's body and i would just be racked with the desire to just choke it to death and I knew it was an entity, and I never gave into it, but I was just astonished that I could feel that at all. And it, and I got to say, he wasn't feeling any of that. It was the entity pushing that feeling into him, pushing that agenda into him. He would never have done it. He's a great father. He's a he, He's an absolutely outstanding father. He's beautiful, wonderful. But the entities can do that when you don't know what's going on and when you're playing around, like a lot of people out here in, in the Twin Cities are playing around with channeling. They don't get it. You know, you got all these folks all over the country, probably all over the world, going in and shooting up theaters, going in and shooting up schools. Well, who do you think's calling those shots? Who do you think is calling those shots, Santara? Entities, Christmas. Yeah, that's right. The entities are doing that. People are opening it 
to these entities through Hollywood, through drugs, through alcohol, through uh, severe desire for self-aggrandizement. People are opening up to entities right and left. And it behooves you. It really does. It behooves you to really look at the Kundalini, open to your Kundalini, begin the education that the Kundalini can give you, go to a teacher that the Kundalini takes you to, partake of that information, get yourself used to being tested by entities, tested for your goodness, tested for your grace, tested for your willingness to be a better person, along the lines of the safety protocols, honesty, integrity, truth, truth, trust, love, consideration, forgiveness, tolerance. All of these qualities are the baseline to help you develop within a kundalini-infested or or an entity-infested world. Kundalini uses these entities as ways to get you educated about where it is you want to go within spiritual evolution. So, yeah, you ignore them all. Every single one, Santara, you ignore every single one of them. The only thing you pay attention to is your kundalini. Over. Thank you, Chris, and thank you very much. Um Okay, so the next one is, I'm going through the motions of interaction with people. I know how to pretend all is well, and I display normal exterior behaviors, but this isn't how I am really feeling. I'm using the safeties, connecting to my kundalini, not following ego, but I'm finding it not easy. Am I missing something from my kundalini? Am I depressed? Can you say something about this, please? Well, you probably are depressed because it's hard to be alone and do these things. It's hard to not have any moral support. And yet, for many, that is part of the path. You don't get to have that instant physical backup that everybody wants to have when they're encountering hard times, a, you know, a loving and understanding spouse or child or boyfriend, girlfriend, grandma, grandpa, aunt, uncle, You know, you don't get to have that instant backup because most of the people here have no clue about Kundalini. And that includes people in India, too. Most people on this world have no clue about the Kundalini. And so, you know, it seems like it's very lonely. It seems like, you know, gosh, you know, that Christum says to practice the safeties. And and what were you expecting? Was it, were you expecting it to be easy? Was that it? Did you have that attachment to Hello? Prison? Hello? Okay. Oh, no. Two seconds, people. I need to... Okay, so Prison has just disappeared. (laughs) He has just vanished completely from the... I need to press the button here or we lose the episode. Okay. Okay. Okay, so I've saved the episode. So what Chrism is going to do now is he's going to ring back in and he should be back online here in no time at all. Does anybody in the chat room want to ask a question? And, um, yeah, we don't... Can you hear me, though? Um, Leonora, can you hear me speaking? Oh, I wonder, have I lost the episode? I'm just going to type, excuse the noise. I just need to check if I'm, yes, okay. Thank you, MJ. Okay, so if anybody in the chat room has a question that they'd like to ask or a point that they'd like to make, that would be fantastic. Thank you, Diva. I'm glad that you can hear me. So I'll just keep the episode going until Chris and calls back in. Um talking about entities and you know interaction and even that last question about being you know feeling low I certainly know myself what that is like sometimes and it can be difficult 
Um, but what I find when I get this feeling of loneliness is that the safety actually helps me to move into a place where um, I can be of service and I can be, you know, in a loving place. And after a while, by practicing um, that behavior, I find that the loneliness or the depression begins to lift. Sometimes I'm not too sure at all why that is, why it's there. I know that recently, I went through a period of, of a lot of bliss. Um, I had two days, actually, where I went through a lot of bliss, um, waves of bliss, and it was going on quite a lot during the day. And then suddenly, I was doing something. I was reading something, and it was on the third day, and I suddenly you know, felt this incredible sense of isolation and being alone. And I got, I, I just felt low. And I know that after, because I've had bliss before, I know that when bliss goes away, there is a withdrawal from the body of, I'm assuming it's endorphins and that beautiful sense of um, love that is within the body during bliss. And I think when it stops, when it stops being so active, the body misses it. And so there's, oh, I find there's always a low after that. And so for a couple of days, I certainly had the sense of um, oh, aloneness or some. It's hard to put a word in it because um, it's not aloneness, but it is just, it's just missing the bliss and yet not attaching to missing it, just being okay with it. And I find when that happens, um, again, the safeties are amazing because they provide a bridge, for me anyway, um, to move back into, it can be almost like a holding place sometimes when I'm struggling with something. I automatically go to that toolbox, as I call it, of the safeties, and I will pull out something like tolerance or I will pull out something like, um, you know, service, safety, or patience, um, even trust, trust that what I'm going through at this particular at this particular time is okay, and that it is part of my Kundalini process. And that happens for me during the week. That um, by practicing the safeties, I moved back into a place of being okay. And it's funny how our ego, isn't it, judges very much what's bad and what's good, what's okay and what's not okay. Because really, there was absolutely nothing wrong with that sense of um, when when the bliss left, what the, the, the feelings that I, there was nothing wrong with those, but my ego framed them as being bad, just like it framed the, the bliss as being good. So I find that very fascinating, even when the bliss is going on, not to attach to it or enjoy it and be in it, but not to feel this is something I want to go on and on. And when it's gone, not to, you know, yearn for it to return, but to just allow the body to adapt and the emotions to adapt and all the various bodies of expression to adapt bring in the safeties, trust, and all these sorts of things. I'm just seeing stuff here, so give me a moment. I'm looking in the... I'm scrolling back up again, guys, for those of you. Okay, so Diva says, we seem to be talking about entities a lot lately, and that makes me uneasy. Yeah, Diva, we are. I'm, it's, it's kind of... It's come up quite a bit in the groups lately. And I can understand why it makes you uneasy. I remember, you know, I used to feel uneasy too. But the amazing thing is the information is powerful and it actually empowers us. And there's no need for us to be fearful because... Because we've heard, you know, as people who are connected into Christian's teachings and who are Kundalini awakened and active, we are able to know that if, and it's a big if, not everybody has entities, if entities, if we are, you know, if entities, if we become aware of them or if they begin to intrude, we have the information to not um, 
form contracts with them. We know how to ignore them. We know how to not get connected into that place. So I think there's no need to fear at all, Diva, that we can actually use it very positively. Um, so, and that's what I would suggest, to, to look at it in a very positive way. Um, MJ says, I need some positive to counter all the... <laughs> <laughs> to counteract all the negative now. You see, I think it is positive. I think we can make it positive. I think we can look on all the information about entities and not go into a place of fear and not to even perceive it as being negative. It just is. It's just part of the the processes and the connections that are out there. There are more entities in the world than there are corporeal people. There's somebody coming on and I'm going to check if that is Chrism. Can you hang on two moments? Okay. Hello? Hi, it's his, it's Chrism's stepbrother. <laughs> yes, you have the same voice. Hi, Pastor. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm just, I'm, just, I'm just reading here. MJ is saying as well, as for me, I see all of this as a metaphor. So how about some talk angel helping us instead of so much concentration on negative entities hurting us? The thing about oh, it, though, yeah. I, the, well, the Go thing ahead, about please. Is, that's, that's wonderful. Go ahead. I think the thing about it is that we are actually responding in a very positive way to the entities, if you know what I mean. And I don't see it in, in such a negative way, uh, Fashji. Do you want to say something about that? Well, yeah. Um, entities are no more than um, people who used to live on this planet or in this world. Uh, you know, we have to demystify this whole thing. That's all it is. And, you know, because of the great levels of attachment, they have uh, sort of uh, grouped themselves under a particular uh, addiction, if you will, uh, whether it be an addiction to alcohol, to sex, to whatever. Um, that's that's pretty much, you know, what we're dealing with. And And I think that if we don't show fear and we don't, uh, uh, show that they might be, uh, you know, more advanced than we are, if, you know, for lack of better words, then they understand that we're in charge of that particular situation. And I think that the choices that they make will be very much affected by that decision in us. Yeah. Well, MJ says, you know, she's not in fear. Um, and she says, I don't even believe in entities. But all the negative energy invested in the subject is wearing me out. And MJ, you know, if you haven't had any experience of entities, I can understand that. And I understand that you come here for inspiration. But there are a lot of people who actually come here and they have had um, contact with entities. I know that entities exist. I've had contact with them as well. And so I think it's it's you know it has to be spoken about um and i think you know there's a lot of good um positive things said and i think as well you know there's inspiration comes in different ways at Ashti, there's a good lot of calls after coming in and i'm going to just let you online to talk and i'm going to check who these people are if that's okay in case prison yes. is one of them so yes. i'm going offline for a minute and um, it's yours okay Okay. All right. All right. Hey, MJ, I'm, I'm looking at uh, your most recent post here. I think where you say, well, I come here for inspiration. And, of course, uh, if we were uh, privileged to be graced by uh, Chrism speaking right now, indeed we would uh, be doing that. But I think that, you know, Shakti sometimes um, has a different agenda Uh it's not always what we expect should be happening. And so I think that we have to stay loose and and, and attentive to what uh, is actually happening in front of us because it's happening for our greatest good. Um, 
So we're talking about entities. I know that it, it's the, you know, it, it makes me, it makes the back of my hair stand too. And I, you know, what little of it I do have. Um, but, um, <laughs> yeah. Okay. I understand that. And um, so let's just Hello. say that. Hi, there you are. Okay, I was, I was at a point. Through. Are you back? <laughs> Yeah, I was at a point where I was at a point where I was treading water, and I'm so glad you came back <laughs> because I was out of my depth. If I ever stopped, I was going to drown. I and you know, what happens to me quite often. Well, you know, we we were looking at MJ has, has some concerns about us uh, speaking so much on entities and. Um, the she comes here for inspiration, and um, that's what she's here for. And I said, unfortunately, Shakti throws us a curve from time to time, and we have to deal with what's in front of us. It's well, not always. Yeah. <laughs> I get it. I she get also it. says that she doesn't want to obsess about entities and thereby draw them to her. Although she ah. also just says she does not really believe in them. So. Anyway, that's well, what we were discussing. If, if she doesn't believe with them, then, then you know there's no problem. Uh, yeah. But uh, uh -huh. plenty of people have the experience, and so for those people, you know, in order because it's such a big deal to to uh, have an entity contact. I mean, to to have that occur for a person, it can be really, really uh, reality shattering. So it's good for us to talk about that, but. You know, I think this conversation has been a very inspiring about how we how we approach attachment, how we are controlled by attachment, how we can avoid attachment. I don't know where I was cut off by Blog Talk Radio in this in the last question uh, with regards to uh, the person who was practicing the safety. What, anybody remember? I I. I yeah, that person was depressed and um, and was practicing the safe disease and wasn't yeah. You you were doing really well with that, but I can't recall where you were with it. I spoke a little bit about bliss then, chrism, because I had actually experienced that last week, and when that's withdrawn and how the safe disease, you know, be it an entity or be it you know depression or whatever. The safeties are like, a, well, for me anyway, can be like a bridge or a holding place or a place that allows me to, you know, begin to do something that um, is a different response to the one that my ego would like to make when it ca when it well, sort of says it's depressed. Well, I'd like I'd like to cover one thing first before we continue with this, and I would like to thank Fashji. For stepping in, I'd like to thank you, Amelia Centara, for stepping in. I'd like to thank Rosemary Goliath for making the call, and I'd like to, you know, to thank uh, Josephine Smith for giving me the ability to call in to the show as well. As I look at my iPad from across the room here, it still froze up. There's nothing coming through there, and so, you know, okay. how interesting is that. But uh, yeah, somebody somebody made the comment as a joke. Perhaps an entity did that. <laughs> MJ, MJ asks the question: Can concentrating on them? Sorry, can't can't concentrating on them so much cause can can concentrating on them so much cause problems? Not if you don't believe in them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to drop off. <laughs> oh, Bashi, much gratitude. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank of you, Bashi. Yeah, if you don't, if, if you, if you really, if you're not experiencing entities and you don't believe in entities, then there's really not going to be a problem for you with entities. Uh, we have to remember that Kundalini is a is a very multi-platformed experiential uh, journey. It's not all about you know floating fairy princesses and sugar plums. It's not about that at all. I mean, and if you come here just to hear the good, well then you're 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 escaping a big part of the journey because there's a lot of challenges too. There's a lot of challenges to it and 
And even though you may not be having that particular challenge, we can't speak to the the uh, the experiences of one person. We have to speak to the experiences of many people. And many people do and will have these, these, kund- these kundalini-based openings into the astral level. Well, they will have contact with entities. And, and blessings to you, MJ, for not having to go through that right now. I think it's wonderful. I think it's she great. She has another question. Okay. And her Thank question you. is, can we talk about Rosemary's angels a bit as an antidote? Hello, don't uh, go it, again. Chris. Yes, oh, you're I'm, there. Not, I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> hang on, hang on. Uh, MJ wants to talk about your angels. Brilliant. Uh, I've been given permission by Rosemary to talk about her angels. She's got about... 17 to 21 of them, they form an arc or a circle. If you look at that Columbia Pictures uh, symbol where the, the stars come floating across the lake, then they form this this halo over a mountain that says Columbia Pictures. You know what I'm talking about, Amelia? I do, yes. That's how her angels cover her. And they don't allow anything to come in there. Uh, she Rosemary has a very, very pure... And she's earned it. It's not something that just came because she was, you know, she was bored one day and asked, you know, (laughs) lots of angels to come in. Um, Do I put some clothing on? Um, She's cold here in her house, so I told her to go put a jacket on. Uh, Yeah, the angels, they're all, the way I see them, they're about 9, 10 inches. This is how they show themselves. They all have their own halos. They're all definitely uh, uh, red and, and suffused rose-colored with white silver, and uh, they just hover. They're just there. When I when I blow energy into rosemary like I did the other night, I uh, you know I just kind of like have a, a thing that I do when I want to give more energy to a student, and it's really fun to just kind of watch them dance on the energy. It's it's quite beautiful, actually. But, Chris, can I ask a question? The difference, Please, yes. the difference, though, is Rosemary's angels are present. They're not controlling But her. they don't, they don't intrude or control or, or we we'll say, step over the Kundalini in any way or, try, you know, they don't. They don't. So they'll, that's a they'll, different they'll thing. They'll dance on it. They'll dance on the Kundalini, but they won't yeah. try to control her. They don't try to interrupt her. They don't try to dominate her. They don't try to do anything that is detrimental to her, to her success in this, in in the Kundalini. Contrary, they do everything they can do to keep negative forces away. And they, it works. Mm -hmm. It works. Mm -hmm. She's very stable. And so do they, like, would they, in a way, step aside for the Kundalini, is I suppose what I'm saying. Oh no! Like they're, the Kundalini they're because, is in charge. They're there because of the Kundalini. Yeah. Okay. Because she's awakened, and because she's exposed to the astral, and because she has—you should see her at the expo. People <laughs> are just galvanized to her. They're just—they're not mesmerized. They're not walking like zombies up to you know Rosemary. <laughs> they're not doing that. <laughs> Good. <laughs> <laughs> but they they come to her and they're just you know they're transfixed in some way they stay they talk with her she's very clear she's very honest she's very approachable she's very loving she's very gifted in contact first contact with a perfect stranger you got to remember this is a woman that makes sleeping bags for the homeless this is a woman that puts together first aid food kits for the homeless this is a woman that was spent the you know you know 25 years of her life on her knees praying for the goodness of this world so yeah she's earned it she's earned those angels they didn't just come because you know i guess she felt like having you know 17 to 21 angels <laughs> Well, MJ is after sending a heart and an LOL, and I think she has enjoyed listening to that. 
Um, Chris, and thank you, Rosemary, for allowing that to be shared. Um, will I ask another question? Thank you. Yes. Okay. Um, so my chakras get very unbalanced sometimes, and when I go into meditation, I am able to align them and bring them back into balance again. I am also able to do this for others. And um, what is your opinion of this? You never do that for others. Others need to do that for themselves. What you can do is you can show others how to do that, but you don't step into somebody else's uh, uh, spiritual equation and start, you know, controlling how that spiritual equation is supposed to go. You can teach, but you must allow them to make the changes they need to make. You do not step in. Okay, so can you say a bit about about the first part then? Are you saying that it is okay um, in meditation? Read it, to, read it to me again. Um, where is it? My chakras get very unbalanced sometimes, and when I go into meditation, I am able to align them and bring them back into balance. No, 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 no. That's 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 pushing your ego ideology of what a balanced chakra is into an area that your ego knows virtually nothing about. Your chakras do not need the assistance of your ego to find balance. Your ego, on the other hand, requires the assistance of the kundalini in order to find the balance within the chakras. And one of the best ways to find balance in your chakras is to practice the safety. Hello? Yes. I can hear you. It just got really quiet on your end there all of a sudden. I can hear you. Okay. So is it, it's going through, right? (laughs) Yeah, it is. is. I must have been talking for like six or seven minutes to a blank. Oh, no. I'm sorry. That happened. I'm a little, yeah, I'm a little, (laughs) I'm a little blog talk radio shy. So, um, yeah, you don't you don't insert your ego, you know the, the the thumb of your ego into the pie of your chakra. You know that's just another form of self-aggrandizement. Oh well, I'm going to go into meditation now, and because I can find balance with my chakras, and because I'm finding balance with my chakras, everyone around me is finding balance in theirs. Think about that. People don't even know what a chakra looks like. And yet, they're balancing them as if they were unbalanced in the first place. You see, this is is a lot of this new age hyperbole. It's like, oh, my chakras need to be cleaned. You know, I mean, you can actually make money here in the Twin City putting up a chakra cleaning station, $20 a chakra. No way. People would, oh, believe me, seriously, I'm not kidding. You could make money. It could be drive through. Okay. okay. Uh, and because Americans love that convenience. Uh, so, so the scenario is, is like people get this ideology that, oh, my chakras are unbalanced. Oh, well, I must go to uh, Mr. So and So Psychic or Mrs. So and So Channeler to. To have Jesus balance my chakras with him. Or I just have to go to my Kundalini and say, Kundalini, I'm going to balance my chakras now. Are you ready? Mm. Take your hands of the ego out of your chakra equation. The chakras know how to handle themselves. They know the Kundalini far better than the ego consciousness knows the Kundalini. Far better. Okay. They know how to reset themselves if they need that. You don't need some psychic's finger or some channeler's finger or your own finger sticking in there to gum up the works because basically you'll just prolong uh, your, your level of, a, of, of trying to awaken the kundalini because you're trying to control the kundalini by inserting yourself into its process. The ego has no business in the processes given by the Kundalini. Matter of fact, 
you take that happy little ego and you take it aside and you say, sit down, watch, listen, and learn. And that's the last you're going to do with anything that's going to be of the ego. Ego is like a seven-year-old kid. Now, how many of you let a seven-year-old kid fly an F-18 jet? Now, I know your seven-year-old is now a 15-year-old, Amelia, but still. (laughs) Okay. You know, this is silly. This is silliness to, to think that that the chakras need you to clean them. This is silly to think that they're dirty at all. Tell me. Tell me how how energy gets dirty. The only thing that, that can really happen to really gum up the works, aside from your ego going in, is, is opening to become a channel. That can screw up your chakras too. Once again, an aspect of the ego. Once again, levels of ego-based aggrandizement. So it's very important that you you allow the Kundalini to teach you what it is that you may be doing uh, in your life that is allowing you to feel that the chakras aren't balanced. And then you correct yourself without sticking your hands in the chakra or thinking that you're some, you know, Mr. or Mrs. Magi. You let the Kundalini do what it knows to do rather than you doing what you're guessing needs to be done. Kundalini knows you far better than you know yourself. Let it do what it needs to do. Over. Thank you, Kundalini. There's a question on the chat room, and um, it's about entities, MJ. (laughs) So here we go. It's from Backstick. And it says, can entities insert content into your dreams that would not have otherwise been there? Yes. Absolutely. That is part of your training. And you're called, forgive me, forgive me if I, if I brutalize your name, Bat Chick, like Bat no, Girl or Bat I, Man? I'll spell it, no, no, I'll spell it for you. It's B A X. TK. You guys always confuse me with this ah for the A. So B A X what? T K. T K. Okay, so so she says call her Kim. <laughs> Kim. Oh, <yeah. laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Kim. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll ask okay. the question again, so, yeah. shall I? No, 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 I got it. Okay. I got it. I okay. got it. I got it. <laughs> so here's the scenario with, with an entity being allowed by Kundalini to insert a thought form or a thought phrase or a series of images into your brain during sleep or into your dream during your, your dream time. The idea is for you to recognize it as not being of you not being yours, and to repudiate it, to take a stand back and go, that's not me, that's not how I think, that's not how I am, this is not of me, go away. Change in the channel, this doesn't speak to me at all. That is the opportunity that a person is being given. And I have, I have private students who are telling me their dreams every day. And this is a common occurrence that an, an entity will step into the dream. Sometimes the entity will dis- disguise itself as Christum, their teacher. You know, and remember what I've been saying about the teacher. You know, the, the teacher is assigned to that individual by their kundalini, and this is a fact. So that entity is allowed to disguise itself as Christum. Think about that. Think about that level of testing. Okay. And this, this dream entity chrism comes along and does something really stupid or something really mean. And the student is going, wait a minute. That's not my teacher. That's just somebody posing as my teacher. I'm going to change the channel. This is silly. I'm out of here. Boom. They change the dream. They pull the plug on the entity every single time. And if they don't do it the first time, the, the entity will typically do something to hang itself anyway. 
But the whole idea is to teach you that you have control of your dream life. You are not the victim of your dream life. You have total control, per the kundalini, of the teachings that come to you in the dream life. You just have to take it. You have to remember it. And I want you, Kim, I want you to use a mantra like that. I have total control in my dream life to change the channel. And I take that control. You go to bed with that thought in your mind. You go to sleep with that thought in your mind. And you will be amazed at what level of conscious dreaming, lucid dreaming, that you begin to, uh, to appreciate. And I know that there's a gentleman listening right now by the name of Foschi who can, who can really speak to this. And uh, is he still on the phone or did he drop off? No, he's dropped off prison. Oh, okay. Because I know that Foschi, based upon some of his uh, earlier training, uh, has, has a direct uh, response to that type of thing. Now, but with, with, with entities being able to, to stick their nose into your dream, yes, they're certainly allowed to do that, but it is always as a teaching, Kim. It is never intended as a control unless, unless you allow it that way. Over. Okay, she says, thank you. Very interesting. So the next question here is, um, can you speak about meditation? On the group, there, actually, this isn't a question. I I wrote this. (laughs) Can you speak about meditation? On the group, there have been conversations about visualizations and focused meditations on the chakras. Again, what are your teachings about a meditation practice in a Kundalini awakening context? Well, in a Kundalini awakening context, you practice the safeties. And you do basically, at one point in the safeties, you're doing a stillness meditation. You're sitting in easy pose or you're sitting in a chair. You're not leaning back in the chair. You're keeping your spine gently erect, not super erect. I still want that S curve in your spine. I want your chin to be slightly tilted down to stretch that spinal cord, not all the way down to to your clavicle, but I want it to just be slightly down, maybe maybe two inches towards your chest, okay, two inches. And then you can, you know, in, in some cases you just do a stillness, you just follow the breath. Your fingers are in position. Your eyes are up. Closed eyelids, eyeballs up, gently up, not so far up that you're, you're straining to keep them up. Although I have to tell you, when I first was compelled to do this by the Kundalini, my eyes would go as far up as I could get them, and I would just work to keep them there. And they would fall back down, and I would put them back up. And they'd be up for a minute or two, then they'd fall back down, and I'd put them back up. Uh, In many cases, you'll have to have that ocular training in order to get those eyes up consistently. But the Kundalini will pull them up. uh, And you respond to that by letting them go up and keeping them up as long as you can. Now, that kind of activity during, say, a stillness meditation is going to take you right out of the stillness meditation. And what you want to realize is that what that meditation session really is about is learning and developing the muscles to keep your eyes going up, to keep them up. When I bring the eyes up now, it's as gentle and effortless as you can be. It feels so good. The third eye so lights up when you do that. It's very beautiful. You see all the colors you see all the sparks, you see all the majesty. But you have to get your ocular muscles fixated on that position first. So so many times a person will enter into that aspect of the safeties and they'll be all, they'll be sitting down, the spine will be gently erect, their chin will be down, their fingers will be in position, their tongue will be up, and their eyes will be fighting to stay up. And I say, go with the ocular positioning first. For those that already have that down, your eyes are up, your tongue is up, your fingers are locked, your chin is down, your spine is gently correct or erect, and then you just follow the breath without, you're not counting, you're just inhaling through the nose and exhaling through the nose if you're 
if your nose is, is uh, plugged up, well, then you, you form your lips into like a whistle, like you're, like you're whistling, and you, you gently draw the air in, you fill the lungs, and you gently release the air through. The, the whole idea is controlled breath. Controlled breath, but without great levels of pushing that control into the breath, okay? Am I still on? Am I being heard here? You're still on, Chris, and yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And so as you do that, you just let, if your eyes are up, well, then the mental imagery that is going to come across, uh, come, come to those eyes, will be very, very different than if your eyes are down. If your eyes are up, you'll, you'll, you might get some clouds of color. You might get little sparkles of, of uh, energy coming by, floating by. You might even get an eye, kind of like a disembodied eye just kind of swimming by. Don't, rec- don't acknowledge any of it. Just let it be. Let it go. Let it be free. Let yourself be. And just let that go for about an hour. Because what's happening during that meditation, you cannot chart with your mental or emotional mind. Hmm. Okay, the, the meditation period is a divine sequence of communication with your inner divine. And, and this is why prayer and meditation can be so, so very important. So that's one method. Another method of meditation is just to, to take a walk in a wilderness park. Notice everything. Notice the little particles of dust in the dirt. Get right down there and look at the, ma- the microcosm within the macrocosm. Feel the air pressure against your hands. Feel the temperature of the air pressure. Feel the animals and their energy as it's coming to you. Feel the plants and the trees and the insects and the fungi and the bacteria and the virus and the and the nano life forms that we haven't even recognized because science hasn't hasn't reached that far yet. Feel the level of nature spirits. Feel everything and just rejoice in that feeling. That's a walking meditation. Another form of meditation is to just paint a picture without wanting a form to it, without planning a form. Just let your mind go. Let your feelings come into your fingers and just paint that picture, whatever it may be, whatever it may become. It'll probably be something that you have to discern. At least that's what it is for me. Uh, and so that's another form of of uh, meditation. And another form of meditation is is just free form dancing. Free form dancing. You don't have to dance fast, but you can if you want. Dancing and just letting your body move the way it wants to move without your ego going oh. Is this the New Yorker step? Is this the proper New Yorker step? One, two, one, two, three, one, two. No. You know, it's not that kind of dancing. It's freeform dancing. It's it's a little bit of Martha Graham. Okay, you're just you're just letting your body move how it wants to move, where it wants to move, when it wants to move. Okay? That can be another form of meditation. Often, I will have my students go to the gym. And they go to the gym, and I give them a 30, 30, 30 uh, lesson plan. And, and Amelia, what is a 30, 30, 30 lesson plan? Um, it is 30 minutes on three different um, exercise programs. So and what specifically- are you doing while you're exercising? Well, I am saying my mantra. I am being devotional. Yes, exactly, exactly. And and so this is another form of meditation amidst very strong physical exertion. And it's bringing that devotion. It's bringing the essence of that mantra into the cells as as they're torn and reformed, torn and reformed, torn and reformed. And it takes the person's mind off of the, you know, the the difficulty of it or the dullness of it or the, 
the lack of creative input of it, and it just really gives the person the solace of a meditational experience within mm-hmm. the confines of heavy physical exertion. Okay, so there's a few methods of of, uh, of meditation that a person can have, and there are many, many, many others. Uh, one one other form of meditation is an eyes open meditation, where your eyes are wide open and staring and not blinking. Although you can blink, don't think you can't blink. I don't want anybody drying their eyes out because Chris and said, "Oh, you can't blink. You can blink." Everybody, I hope that's been heard. Everybody, you can blink. Uh, I do not recommend sun gazing. I do not recommend sun gazing in any way, shape, or form. And so, you know, that's not something that is conducive to kundalini, even though people think it is. Because they, you know, they see the kundalini as the inner sun, which I can't deny. I see it that way as well. But sun gazing is not the answer. Another form of of uh, really beautiful meditation is to just spend time in the garden. Talk to those plants. Nourish those plants. Help those plants. Talk to the soil. Talk to the insects. You know, that is a wonderful form of meditation. Get your hands in the dirt. Get your feet in the dirt. Don't be afraid to get a little dirty. Don't be afraid to... to to have that beautiful garden in any way, shape, or form that you like. That is another beautiful form of meditation. And then there's there's a chakra breathing meditation, and there's there's vocalization meditation, such as the ah. Do that for 21 minutes. That's an amazingly powerful meditation. I go for the very, very simple meditations. I'm not going, okay, you have to sit facing south by southwest, 10 degrees to the left with a, uh, with, a with an azimuth of 5.079991 degrees. And then as you're doing that, you need to have your eyes looking off to the left but as you are, do the outbreath, your eyes need to suddenly shift to the right. You know, it's like, no, 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 no. Let's, let's keep it easy. Let's keep it gentle. Let's keep it consistent. Let's do it for an hour, at least an hour. Okay. Over. Thank you, Cousin. Could I ask about a particular meditation that I often hear people or read as well, people speaking about, and that's that ball of energy. That, you know, people move the ball of energy through their bodies, blah, blah, blah. Well, what oh, would your oh, feel? Oh, like are, are they talking about the microcosmic orbit, that one? Yes. Ah. That's yeah, one of them. Yes, uh, yes. Once again, that's... That's a Taoist practice, and oh my gosh, the Taoist people will just swear by that. Well, you know, you have to spin the ball at the base of your spine, on your inner spine. You have to spin the ball to the right, and that ball has to rise through each of your chakras, and then it comes up into your head, it hits the forehead, it ricochets to the back of your head, and it ricochets back down your spine just to be spun to the right again so that it comes up your spine, and it goes to the forehead and it ricochets to the back and it ricochets back. No, 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 no. Nor do you need to have the ball of energy that's that's going over your external processes. You're going up the middle of the spine and under the chin and over the chin and over the lips and under the nose and over the nose and up the eyebrows and into the fontanelle and down the back and down the shoulder blades and down the crack of your rear end and then up the genital area and then, yeah, please, please. I think this is just what they invented to take your mind off other things. And and that would be very, very good. I mean, and the the deal is to do them both at the same time. (laughs) I kid you not. The deal is to do them both at the same time. I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. I, yeah. I, I find it, I find it bogus. And in, in one, <coughs> a man who I who I honor because I 
because he's a very kind, caring individual, at least towards the end of his life. Uh, you know, he was telling me because, you know, how in my early process I was having entity issues and blah, blah, blah. And this guy was a martial artist. And even though, you know, martial artists can only take the energy so far, uh, he was giving to me. He was giving to me what he was given to handle the entity issue, right? And he says, "Okay, what you do is you you, you run your microcosmic ball right through them, and then you eat them, you consume them <laughs> with your." <laughs> okay. <laughs> and I was going, "Oh boy!" I tried it a few times. It was weird. Uh, it didn't work. It didn't get rid of them. It just kind of gave me something to do instead. You know, these guys will go into the void and, 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 you know, ask for a couple of Chinese lions or some some sort of a, you know, type of deal that way and let those eat them. And then, well, that was better than the last one, but okay, you know, I, I, the Kundalini gave me other answers and, and I, and God bless him. God bless his soul. He's a good man. Uh, but that was not advice that I would give to anyone today. Um, you don't need to do the microcosmic or the macrocosmic orbit at all in order to have a steady, beautiful, wonderful experience of the Kundalini. The other ball energy uh, meditation is to is what the Qigong people do, and I do support this, is to see that orange ball between your two hand chakras, between your two hand chakras, and let that ball grow and then drop it onto a plant, drop it onto uh, a hurt foot, push it into an area of your body that you you might be feeling pain or something like that. But the Qigong people do this, and this is not a bad deal. This is using qi energy to help your health, and that's that's a good meditation as well. I have people, I have my private students go from plant to plant, okay, you know, put see the ball as a as a ping pong ball size, and make it the size of a tennis ball, then the size of a basketball, and drop it on that plant with love. Here you go, plant, love you. Then move to the next one. Okay. Mhm. Over. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Clayton. And I have one more question. Is it she? Where is it? Um. Okay. Uh, it was about food. Where has it gone? Two seconds. Oh, yes. Why does Kundalini bring so many changes into our food intake? Recently, I didn't want to eat anything except fruit for days. Surely this isn't healthy for the body. Well, surely it is. How do you know what's healthy for the body? You know, Western people go to an MD to take responsibility for their health. They don't take their own responsibility for their health. They don't know what an energetic anatomy requires. They don't even know what a physical anatomy requires. They depend on the MD for that. So surely the Kundalini is saying, yes, organic fruits right now is the only thing I want you to eat. And then next month it may say, oh, Chrisom, guess what? Menu change. Organic meats are the only thing I want you to eat, and I want them to be unprocessed, i.e. no beef jerky and no cured meat sweet meat or anything like that. I want you to go out and get some venison or or get some fish, go fishing, or maybe, you know, eat some some organic free-range meat. Oh, Prism, we're actually, Prism, I'm interrupting you because we're on the last-minute countdown. I didn't realize. Ah, no, no, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for listening. Uh, Thank you, Santara. Thank you, Fasty. Thank you, MJ. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, everybody, for participating in this show. I'm sorry. Blog Talk cut us off. I'm going to end the show, Amelia. But I okay. I think, what? What, Rosemary? Thank you, Rosemary. <laughs> okay. I'm going, to, I'm going to press the end episode here, Chris, and we're down to 22 seconds anyway. All right. Bye-bye, everyone. See you next, see you next.